us, we want to thank God. Uh, we come to you again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to uh, pray and believe that this word we have been speaking to you has been a blessing and has continued to give you strength and to build you up in your faith. Uh, so uh, I take this opportunity to welcome you again in this program and uh, we believe that the Spirit of God will minister to us and that uh, the Word of God will continue to establish us, will continue to lift us, will continue to exalt us because uh, the purpose for the Word of God, the Bible says that it's to build us. Uh, uh, the Word of God is sent to us so that we can be built, so that we can grow in our faith. So I want to believe that your faith has been growing as we have continued to speak the Word of God to you. This has been a week for me for Thanksgiving and uh, just thanking God because of who He is. Uh, Psalms 100 has been very key uh, in my life. Not so because uh, of tangible things. Yes, there are things that God has done physically, but that has not been my emphasis. I've been thanking God because of who He is. So I urge you that uh, even in the midst of everything, a cold, a, a, a spirit of thanksgiving, and the Lord will continue to minister to you, and He will continue to encourage and give you strength. So last week we began a series on dwelling in God's presence, dwelling in God's presence, and I don't want to go back so much to what we said, but I can just uh, say a few things because of them that are joining us for the first time so that we can go together. So our key verse was Exodus chapter 33 uh, from 12 to 15 where God told, uh, where Moses told God that he will not be able to uh, uh, carry on with the children of Israel if the presence of God would not go with him. And the Lord is faithful. He promised that, uh, the, that, that his presence would always go with him and he would give him rest. So we say that uh, dwell come from the word, the word dwell comes from the Hebrew word they are sharp, and it means to sit down or to settle, to remain or to inhabit, inhabit meaning to abide, to live in, to occupy and stay. And so we establish that it is the will of God for us not to uh, just be there uh, or our relationship with God should not be determined by circumstances. In other words, when things are going on well in our lives, we are there, we are abiding in the Word, but when we are tried, when our, te our faith is tested, then we are not found trusting in God or following His Word. And therefore we say that the will of God is for us to settle in His presence. In and out of season, we should remain, we should abide in God's presence. So we, we also saw that uh, the first record of man experiencing, experiencing the divine presence is in the Garden of Eden. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. And we said that God planted a garden there for man. And this garden was the garden of God. And we saw that this was the meeting place for man and God. And Eden we saw that it's a Hebrew verb which means to delight. And this was a place of joy, it was a place of thanksgiving, a place of voice of melody. And so we say that the will of God from the beginning, we saw it from Genesis, is that man and God would fellowship together. However, we saw that uh, because of self, uh, man was not able to continue uh, with his fellowship or the uh, uh, man hid from the presence of God because he allowed self to come in and we say that the greatest hindrance for us to dwell in God's presence, the greatest hindrance for us to remain and rest in God's presence is doing what? Is when we allow self to uh, dominate in our lives. And so we saw that because of self, uh, uh, Adam and Eve lost that position and we know at least through Christ we were restored to this position. However, it's not automatic that because you are born again, that, uh, that you will automatically, uh, automatically uh, dwell in the presence of God. You have to do it. And we saw that Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, 
from the beginning, the Bible says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So we say, for us to dwell or remain, abide, inhabit the presence of God, we have to turn our relationship with God. We have to watch over it. We have to work for it. We have to dress it. We have to cultivate our relationship with God. And so we begin from there uh, today. For us to live in God's presence, we must guard our relationship with Him. And so we want to begin from there. How do we guard or how do we cultivate our relationship with God? So before I continue with that, I want us to go first, uh, back to our key verse. We'll keep reading it until it becomes imprinted in our hearts. So the Bible, the Bible says, Exodus chapter 33, yes, we begin from 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So that is where our, uh, our topic is coming from, or our theme, that is where we picked our theme from, dwelling in God's presence. So we are saying that uh, from Genesis we see a record and we see the original intent of God was for man and God to fellowship, to commune, uh, was the original intent for, uh, for God, uh, from God, was that uh, man may dwell in his presence. But we saw um, uh, man moving away from his presence because of self. He, allowed self, Eve allowed self to deny them a chance to do, to commune and fellowship uh, with God in the Garden of Eden. However, through the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ, we were restored back to that place. But as I've said, it's not automatic that because you are born again, that uh, you don't need to work out your salvation. In fact, the Bible says that we work out our salvation. So for us to maintain our relationship, with Christ for us to abide in God's presence, there is a responsibility that the Spirit places on us. And that is what we are looking at. We have to cultivate our relationship with God for us to dwell in God's presence. So how then do we cultivate our relationship with God? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11, maybe we can read it in message translation, uh, Hebrew chapter 5 verse 11 says I have a lot more to say about this but it is hard to get it across to you since you have picked up this bad habit of not listening verse 12 by this time you ought to be teachers yourself yet here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again starting from square one Baby's, uh, baby's milk when you should have uh, been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners inexperienced in God's ways. Verse 14, solid food is for the mature who have uh, some practice in telling right from wrong. So how do we cultivate our relationship with God? We see a very key uh, 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 verse here, verse 13. How do we cultivate our relationship with uh, God? So he tells them, milk is for beginners in experience in God's ways. In other words, we should grow in God's word. For us to dwell, to stay, to remain, to inhabit, to occupy God's presence, we have to do what? We have to grow in God's word. We have to grow in God's word. In other words, for us to do what? To dwell in God's presence, we have uh, to, to allow ourselves, we, have, uh, we are seeing it from Hebrews, we have to allow ourselves to do what? To uh, see, uh, spiritually grow. So we are talking about spiritual maturity is key for us to dwell in God's presence. Spiritual maturity is very key 
for you to dwell in God's presence. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So spiritual maturity has to do with perfection and uh, being perfect or the Bible says that we may present every man perfect. So that word perfect means mature, fully grown, complete or finished. That word perfect. So we are talking about how do we cultivate our relationship for us to dwell in God's presence. We have to allow ourselves to grow spiritually. And spiritual maturity has to do with the perfection that Colossians is talking about here. And being perfect means we must be mature, fully grown, complete, and finished. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, you see it is repeated there, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So for us to dwell in God's presence, yes, Hebrews has told us we have to come from milk and to start eating solid fruit, uh, food. We have to spiritual, live, uh, we have to be spiritual, uh, we, we have to, to mature spiritually. And what causes us to mature spiritually is what? Is growing in God's word, growing in the knowledge of God. What causes your knowledge to grow in the Lord is the word of God. So the will of God for us to dwell in God's presence, we have to allow the Lord to perfect us every day. Spiritual maturity is being more like Christ, becoming more like Him. So do you want to dwell in God's presence? You have a responsibility. You and me have a responsibility to do what? To allow the word of God to bring us to a place of maturity. To allow the word of God to perfect us. To allow the word of God to make us become more like him. Now growing is a process. We are talking about spiritual maturity in connection to dwelling in God's presence. That if we want to dwell in God's presence, we have to grow. We have to allow our spiritual lives to grow. And growing is a process. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Growing is a process. The Bible says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. So we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we dwell in God's presence when we allow ourselves to grow in grace. And how do we grow in grace? Acts chapter 20 verse 32. How do we grow in grace? How do we grow in grace? So now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So I commend you to God, to the word of his grace. So growing is a process and what is helping us to grow, what is bringing us to this place of perfection where we are able to uh, relate or cultivate our relationship uh, with Christ or with God. Growing is a process. So what is making us to grow or how are we growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ is by his word. So I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So there is no shortcut to spiritual growth. It is not automatic we must learn to be mature. It is something we learn to do. Just like a small child learns uh, that we are not all born uh, knowing the things we know right now. It has been a process from birth to where you are right now, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 80 years. We are, have all been going through a process of growth. So growth is not automatic. Growth we must learn to mature. So spiritual maturity also requires discipline. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. So we are pursuing to dwell in God's presence and we are saying uh, from the beginning so the original intention of God was 
man to dwell in his presence, but he allowed self to come in and he was able to be alienated in God's presence. All the same, by God's mercy, through the second Adam, he sent Jesus Christ to die for us and we were restored into that position. So it's not automatic that you remain in that position. The word of God places a responsibility to us so that we cultivate a relationship with Christ so that we can dwell in his presence. And we are saying uh, uh, the responsibility that God is giving you and me as a Christian is to spiritually mature. So we are talking about spiritual maturity for us to be able to do do what handle the presence of God, dwell in the presence of God. So spiritual maturity also requires discipline. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 tells us, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him de uh, deny himself and take up his cross daily. Look at that. Must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny himself and take up his cross daily. Now that word deny means giving up anything that hinders you to do the will of God. That word deny means give it, you can give up anything that hinders you to do the will of God. In other words, for you to cultivate a relationship with Christ so that you can dwell in his presence, stay and remain and settle there. You have to deny yourself. You have to give up anything. And I want to ask you as a minister, I mean, what is that that has been a hindrance for you to settle your relationship with Christ? What has been hindering you to settle in God's presence? What has been hindering you to remain in God's presence? So giving up anything that hinders you to do the will of God. So we are talking about spiritual maturity. We have to allow ourselves to spiritually mature for us to remain in God's presence. And we are saying spiritual maturity requires discipline. What discipline? You deny yourself and you take up your cross daily. You take up your cross daily. That daily, uh, taking up your cross daily has to do with sacrifice to self to please God. Sacrifice to self to do what? Uh, to please God. And we saw the greatest hindrance for man and for, for, for man to dwell in Eden. Uh, uh, the greatest hindrance. What caused uh, man uh, to come out of the presence of God was what? Was self. And therefore, for us to dwell in God's presence, we saw that God would come and visit Adam and Eve at the cool of the day. In other words, through his spirit, he would minister to them. And so this particular day he comes and they are hiding from his presence. Why? Because Eve allowed him herself to be deceived. Self came in and, and, and uh, what happened? Uh, self denied them the chance to commune and fellowship and tend their, their relationship with God. So self, so spiritual maturity has to do with what requires discipline of denying yourself, in other words, giving up, giving up anything that hinders you to do the will of God and also daily sacrifice to self to please God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. So spiritual maturity is key for us to dwell in God's presence. The Bible says, but reject profane and old wife fables and exercise exercise yourself toward godliness another version says discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness discipline so spiritual maturity requires discipline so do you want to remain in god's presence do you want to settle in god's presence do you want to uh, occupy inhabit god's presence then you have to dis uh, discipline your, yourself this discipline is cultivated by obeying the word of God. Now, there are characteristics of a mature Christian. So Hebrews has told us to mature, and I'm connecting this to, for us to dwell in God's presence, we have to allow ourselves to grow. And what is helping us to grow, or what tool are we using to grow, is the word of God. So we have to discipline ourselves. We have to allow the word of God to help us discipline our, ourselves. 
So, what are the characteristics of a mature Christian? What are the characteristics of a mature Christian? Number one, Philippians chapter one, verse nine. Philippians chapter one, verse nine. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment and uh, in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve to the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ so a mature Christian we go back to verse 9 a mature Christian is uh, that's what and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Give us in the NIV. NIV translation says this. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That your love may do what? May abound. So as you abound in love, you are able to grow in your knowledge and in your insight in the things of God. So a mature Christian is one that is marked by love Matthew chapter 22 37 to 40 Matthew 22 37 to 40 says Jesus replied love the Lord you are God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and the greatest commandment so do you want to mature as a Christian then your life should be marked by love so what determines whether we are going to remain in God's presence is our spiritual maturity and a mature Christian the first characteristic we see is that this Christian is full or is marked by love and finally John chapter 13 verse 35 uh, John chapter 13 verse 35 says by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you will love one another so if you are growing in Christ we will see ourselves by both loving God more and loving others not only loving God no there are those who say that uh, uh, I just love God but it's not only loving God but loving other, uh, uh, others also in other words a mature Christian is marked by love his love for God and his love for others and remember the Bible says you cannot say that you love God if you don't love your brother or your sister so spiritual maturity in connection to dwelling in God's presence you want to settle remain in God's presence you must do what your life must be marked by love both love for God and for the others the other characteristics of, um, of a mature Christian is found in the same Philippians, we go back to verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, we read again, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of his insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So you are growing in love, and also we see what you are growing in knowledge. So a mature Christian, their life is marked by love and their life is marked by growing knowledge what is causing you to grow psalms verse 119 105 psalms 119 verse 105 your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path do you want to settle and rest and dwell in god's presence the word of god must become a lamp to your feet and a light to all your path in other words what directs, what governs, what leads your decisions, your mind, your everyday life, what governs you should be the word of God. So the second character of a mature Christian is that they do what they grow in the knowledge. And what causes you to grow in knowledge is the word of God. So your, the word of God becomes a lamp to your feet and a light to all your parts. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better knowledge we are talking about knowledge a spiritual uh, uh, someone who is spiritually maturing or growing in the Lord they are marked by love and also they are marked 
by the knowledge they have of the word of God. So I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. So the other way you know that you are growing as a Christian is when you do what? You subject yourself to the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Christ better and you know him through his word. And finally, Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Uh, verse 20 and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross the word of god the word of god do you want to, to know if you are growing as a christian your life should your life should be marked by love love for god and the others and you should be growing in the knowledge of god and this knowledge is coming as you do what as you pursue the word of god as you read and study as you hear as you pursue to do what your well, what the word of god is teaching you a mature christian also is able to discern good from evil hebrews chapter 5 verse 13 to 14 a mature christian is able to discern good from evil so we are saying we are able to we will be established in god's presence when we allow ourselves to grow spiritually and we are looking at the character of a mature christian they are full of love both for god and for the others and also they are full of the knowledge they are full of the wisdom and the, rev the revelation that comes from the word of god and number three they are hot they are able to discern good from evil anyone who lives on milk being still uh, on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness so a mature christian is able to discern good from evil and from this scripture how are you able to discern good from evil as a christian is to do what is the teaching of righteousness so you subject your heart your spirit to the teaching of righteousness motivational speaking is good it can encourage and do all those things that we desire but then as a christian as much as you listen to motivational speaking it is good to do what to subject your heart to teaching teaching about righteousness uh, uh, what enables you to discern evil from good is the teaching of righteousness so a mature christian is able through the teaching of righteousness that you receive, you are able to discern. A mature Christian will be able to test everything. If you subject your spirit to the teaching of righteousness, you will be able to discern good from evil, evil and you are able to do that by testing because of the word, the, because you are full of the word, because you are full of wisdom that comes from the word of God, because you are full of righteousness that uh, is deposited to, to you through the teaching of righteousness. Because of that, you are able to test everything. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 21 to 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 21 to 22. Test everything and hold on to the good. So you are able to avoid every kind of evil. So test everything, hold on to what is good and test and avoid every kind of evil. So you are able to know you are maturing as a Christian when you are able to test everything and you are able to hold on what is good you are able to do what to discern good from evil so and we are saying you are able to do you are able to discern when you subject your spirit and your heart to the teaching of righteousness we are talking about dwelling in god's presence and dwelling in god's presence has to do with our spiritual maturity we have to allow ourselves to grow to grow in love to grow in knowledge and to grow in our discernment of good and evil the fourth character of a mature Christian is that they are marked by spiritual integrity. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10. They are marked by spiritual integrity so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless. I want you to see that. So that so when you subject your heart or your spirit to the teaching of righteousness, you are able to discern what is best, what is good what is evil and then 
you and, and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So that purity and blameless has to do with integrity, the practice of honesty, no matter the situation. So integrity, purity and blamelessness has to do with integrity. And integrity means the practice of honesty, no matter the situation. So do you want to dwell in God's presence? Integrity must become part of your character as a mature Christian. Integrity must become part of us as Christians. Integrity must become part of us as what? As believers. So the practice of honesty, no matter the situation. So when Paul was praying for the Christians to be blameless, he was not praying for perfection. You see, when we read that word blameless, uh, what comes to our human minds is someone who has never seen, someone who has never done anything wrong. Uh, perfection in terms of being perfect. Like, you see, even the Bible says that no one can say that they have never seen. So we are not talking about the human perfection. So when Paul is talking about being pure and blameless, he's saying, uh, he was praying for them to be free from hypocrisy. In other words, uh, he was praying for them to be free from hypocrisy, to be pure. Whatever happened to their life or whatever they do, they do it with the integrity of heart. Now when we go back to the Garden of Eden, we realize uh, what lacked in Adam and Eve was transparency. You see, when God came to them and asked, uh, 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 came looking for them and they were hiding, you see, uh, the woman started to uh, blame them. The man started to blame the woman. So they were not able to really say what happened. They started blaming each other. There was no transparency. So that's why they hid from God's presence. So for us to dwell in God's presence, we must learn to be blameless. We have to uphold our integrity in every aspect, in every area. We have to uphold integrity. So for us to dwell in God's presence, we must learn to be pure. We must learn to be blameless. And that word blameless has to do with being not being perfect in our human mind, so to say, but we must learn how to deal with our flaws in a way that pleases God. Let me say that again. We have to learn. You will do mistakes. You know, sometimes you will find yourself uh, not walking according to the ways of God. But the issue is, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with your relationship with God when it comes to when you do something that is out of the will of God? So we see Adam and Eve coming out of the presence of God because they were not able to take responsibility. Hypocrisy blinded their hearts. They were not able to come out clearly to express what had happened to them. And so for me to explain exactly what I mean uh, by being blameless, we can look at Psalms 51 from verse 1 to 4. We see David, he committed a number of sins and uh, uh, sins that in our human mind we call serious sins. Uh, so he committed them, but let's uh, see his attitude towards God. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you see, he talks to God and tells him, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. So he tells God, you alone, against you, against you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. In other words, he does not hide his heart towards God. And I want to believe that's why, that's part of the reason why God would say that David was a man after God's own heart. He knew when he sinned, he would come out clearly and say that this is how I am. I'm not hiding anything from you. And you know, 
when we talk about blamelessness, as I'm saying, we are not saying that we are perfect. But how do you deal with your flaws? How do you deal with your sins? How do you deal when you have done something against the will of God? So this is the attitude. You come to God. You do it in a way that pleases God. So purity and blamelessness for us to dwell in God's presence. There has to be the aspect of integrity. We have to be pure. We have to be blameless before God. So when he sinned, he comes out clearly. And like uh, Adam and Eve, he comes out clearly and says, uh, I have done all that and I know against you. So he sinned against uh, Uriah because of taking his wife. But he says, against you, oh God, I've done all that on the earth. But I know uh, by offending these people, I offended you. So he comes out clearly. Uh, and God is able to have mercy upon him. So for us to dwell in God's presence, we have to be spiritual, spiritually mature. And our spiritual maturity has to do with what? Has to do with our spiritual integrity. The fifth thing, a mature Christian is marked by the fruit of righteousness. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Or we go back to 10 so that we... Yeah, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. A mature Christian is marked by the fruit of righteousness. Fruit of righteousness. Philippians chapter 1 verse 11 is telling us the fruit of righteousness. So for us to dwell in God's presence, then we have to have this fruit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, which is, which is this fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit. So I define the fruit of righteousness as the fruit that has all this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So I define the fruit of righteousness as a fruit that has all these characteristics. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of uh, lips that confess his name. So the fruit of righteousness. I take it as the fruit of our lips. So we worship God with every part of our being. So uh, discipleship is a fruit of righteousness also. Romans chapter 1 verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I may have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Just as I've had the other Gentiles. So discipleship is a fruit of righteousness. So as a mature Christian, uh, our life should be marked by the fruit of righteousness. And we have seen it in Philippians, we have seen it in Colossians, in Hebrews, and in Romans. Now, we also cultivate our relationship with God. So that was our first, our first point. We cultivate our relationship with God when we allow ourselves to grow in God's word. And that's why I have labored to speak about spiritual maturity, because it is God's word that matures us as Christians. The other thing that uh, we cultivate our relationship with God is by practicing what we learn. Do you want to dwell in God's presence? Allow yourself to grow spiritually. And I've shown you how we grow spiritually. The other thing, practice what you learn. James chapter 2, 22 to 25. Practice what you learn. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified but by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and set them off in a different direction.
So our faith, we must practice what we learn. Our faith has to produce action. Our faith has to be backed by practice. We have to practice what we learn. We have to show if you have learned about wisdom. Let your actions show you as a wise man as, or as a wise woman. If you have learned about dwelling in God's presence, let that glory, let that presence radiate in your life as you do that that demands you uh, to do for you to dwell in God's presence. So we practice what we learn. Matthew chapter 8, 24 to 27. So we cultivate our relationship with God by allowing ourselves to grow uh, spiritually and also by practicing what we learn. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over, over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. In other words, he expected them to practice what he has been preaching to them. They have seen Jesus do uh, great things or perform miracles, heal people, I mean, uh, cast out demons in the lives of people. And so all through this time, he expected their faith to have developed. And therefore, he did not expect them to be afraid. And that's why he's telling them, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up and read. So he expected them to rebuke the winds and the waves. In other words, he expected a fruit from his walk with them. He has been teaching them these things. He had, They have seen him perform all these miracles. So he expected that through their walk with him, through the teachings he had given them, he expected to see a fruit. He expected some action in such situations. But then it was not of them. So when we practice what we learn, then we do what? We, 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 we will be able to dwell in God's presence. What is making us dwell in God's presence? What is making us abide in God is His Word. And His Word not only had knowledge, but when we practice what He has taught us, when we practice what we have read, when, when we practice what we have heard, when we practice the teachings that we have received over the years. So we practice. So we dwell in God's presence when we practice what the Word of God says. Practice. The Bible says in James that faith without action is dead. So it is time that our fruit does what? Uh, it is time that our faith bears fruit. So we will dwell in God's presence when we are able to practice what we learn. The other thing, uh, for us to cultivate our relationship with God that establishes in His presence, we must seek his person, not only his principles. We must seek his person, not only his principles. Psalms 27 verse 8. Psalms 27 verse 8 says, My heart says of you, seek his face, your face, O Lord, I will seek. Now the word face in that verse means the presence of the person. God is a person. God God is in, interested in fellowshipping with you, talking with you, and being involved with every part of your life. God is interested. Let me say that again. God is interested with you and is interested in being involved in every part of your life. And Moses knew he, he knew this secret. That is why he told the Lord, yes, you are sending me, you have given me an assignment, but who is going with me? And therefore God had to promise his presence. So for us to dwell in God's presence, God is interested in fellowshipping with us, not the many scriptures that we have in our heads and in our hearts, but he's interested to be involved in every part of our life. The problem with us as believers is that we embark on many activities, but we, not, we do not carry God along with us. Let me say that again. The problem with many believers is that we embark on many activities. 
you want to do so much in the church you want to worship you want to sing you want to do it is not bad to serve but as you do that are you carrying god along with you what is the spirit and the motive behind it i mean how why and how are you doing it so many believers they want to do many things for god they want to give they want to sing they want to do all these things these activities in the church but the issue is how are you doing it how is the condition of your heart how is your character because for you to dwell in god's presence you must seek his person not only his principles and we are seeing that so the word face is the uh, in the verse means presence of persons my heart says of you seek his face your face oh lord i will seek so practice his presence in everything that you do so have that conscience, uh, conscience that God is in you. We saw that, that God dwells in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we do things and uh, when we look at some of us, we realize like, you know, you are doing this, you are here and God is there. But do it. Everything you do, let the character of God reflect in you. The way you raise your family. The way you relate with people back at work, the way you relate with people where you do business, the way you relate with people wherever you are, is not about what you do, but in whatever you do, is God seen in it? Is the character of God seen in it? Is kindness seen, seen in it? Is patience seen in it? I mean, when we look at what you do, when we look at your all, all your interactions, do we see God? So we dwell in God's presence when we seek His person. And I think it is time that we slowed down on activities and cultivated our relationship with God. Because for us to dwell in God's presence, we have to practice his presence whatever the word of god says we whatever we read in the bible has to become our reality whatever we study in the bible god wants us to move from what we know in our minds and let it become a reality in our lives so we seek his person not only his principles first chronicles chapter 16 verse 11 First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 11 look to the Lord and his strength seek his face always his face always his face seek his face always so what have you been seeking what have you been seeking have you been seeking his face or have you been seeking fame have you been seeking to be known by men have you been seeking to get uh, praise from men so we seek, we seek him as a person. Whatever we do, uh, we do it because we want to reflect the glory and the presence of God in our lives. John, uh, First Chronicles 16, or oh, is there? John uh, uh, chapter 17, verse 3. John chapter 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, uh, Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is to intimately know so now this is eternal life eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have said so eternal life is to intimately know the father and his son jesus christ when you get born again the greatest asset gained is the newfound ability to fellowship with the father and with the son and we saw that when we were talking about the holy spirit the greatest uh, fellowship you can have is a fellowship with the father and with the son and you are able to fellowship with the father and the son by the power of the holy spirit so you fellowship with god whatever you do is governed or springs out from your relationship with god whatever even if it is to serve whatever capacity or whatever gift that god has given you whatever you do anywhere in church in your place of work in your family whatever you do let it be governed by your relationship with god because only then your the presence of god can be manifest so you seek his person not only not only his principles don't just be a person who knows the bible so much but when we look at your life, we cannot be able to see the example. We cannot be able to see 
the word that you read or the word that you study, when we look at your character, when we look at how you treat people, when we look at your relationship at your place of work, when we look at how you treat your family, we are not able to see the grace of God in your life. So we must seek his person, not only his principles. We are talking about dwelling in God's presence. So we do that by seeking him as a person. Know God in a personal way. I want to believe if, uh, if Eve knew God in a personal way, then with the choices presented to uh, her by the enemy, she could have valued the word of God more than what the enemy was giving unto her. Jesus Christ was subjected to the same temptation, but then he did not give in unto it. He was able to confront the enemy by the power of the word of God. Why? Because he knew the Father in an intimate way. So for us to grow, for us to dwell in God's presence, we must cultivate our relationship with God. We have to know him in a personal way. We have to know his ways. We have to know who he is. We have to know his, his love. We have to know all his attributes for us to be able to do what? To dwell in the presence of God. So as we come to the end of this program, I want to believe that the Lord has ministered to you and God is uh, laying a demand on us uh, by the power of the Spirit to go and do what? And cultivate our relationship with Him, to go and desire to pursue, to grow spiritually, to grow our love for Him and the others. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you and bless you because of the power of your word. Yes, we desire to dwell in God's presence. And just like Moses desired that though you had given him an assignment, he uh, asked you that he would only be able to uh, do it only if you sent your presence together with him. And also we pray in our lives that, Lord, we refuse to do anything out of your presence because we desire to be led and be guided by you, O God. And in our Christian life, we pray that we shall pursue to grow spiritually, O God, that we shall not only seek your principles, but we shall seek an intimate uh, fellowship and communion with you. So God, we pray that you help us, even as we surrender to you in every aspect of our lives. We thank you and we bless you. It is in Jesus' mighty name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen.